Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to address the spring meeting of the Quality Customer Service Network. And I'm also delighted to co-launch the latest edition of the Customer Communications Toolkit for Services uh, to the public. Communications plays a critical role in how we provide information about our public services and also how we deliver those services. When we inform the public about our services and how to access them, and as we deliver those services, we have important opportunities. And indeed, we have obligations to ensure that the way that we communicate results in trusted, effective and accessible public services. That will make a real difference to people's lives. In practical terms, this means that we need to think carefully about how we communicate in a wide range of contexts. And that includes whether we're communicating online, uh, in written form, in spoken form, signed communications, and also through the forms and the documents and the signage that we produce. So what I'm saying is that we need to make sure that we elevate our customer focus and that we can do this by bringing the perspective of our service users to the centre of all of our efforts in service design and delivery. The Quality Customer Service Network has been promoting and developing this customer focus for almost 20 years. The network supports implementation of the Quality Customer Service Initiative and this is based on 12 guiding principles and it aims to improve both service design and also delivery and how we engage with the public. The network provides an important platform to identify best practice and emerging issues in customer service. And it also helps us to collaborate and to share learning across the public service uh, collaboration and shared learning are central to strengthening our capacity to deliver excellent services. I'm delighted that the QCS network has continued its collaboration with the NDA in developing and updating a very crucial element of the QCS initiative. That's the communications toolkit. Well, since that toolkit was first developed by the NDA and deeper in 2017, the customer communications toolkit has, has become a vital support for all civil and public servants. It has really provided us uh, with the opportunity to adopt a universal design approach to our customer communications and that allows us to create services which can be accessed and understood and used to the greatest extent uh, by as many people as possible. Well, since 2017, Toolkit has been updated to ensure that it remains as relevant as ever to the rapidly changing environment in which we deliver our public services. The Toolkit really helps our organisations to deliver on the promise of the 12 guiding principles and it supports implementation of reform programmes like the CSR 2030 and the forthcoming framework for public service transformation. The latest edition of this toolkit includes improvements made as a result of user feedback and also updates to reflect recent changes in legislation and terminology. The toolkit can be used to inform planning, training and procurement in relation to customer service it can also help to provide a better user experience for the public and for the internal customers in our own organisations. So I want to thank the Centre for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority for the dedicated work in developing this edition with my department. I also want to recognise the work of the Network and Steering Group for their input in developing this update. And lastly, I would like to thank the many sectoral experts and representative bodies who helped to shape this latest edition of the toolkit, including the National Adult Literacy Agency. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone to use this updated edition of the Customer Communications Toolkit to ensure that together we continue to provide excellent services to the people of Ireland. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thanks very much for joining us this morning. Um, just before we begin to mention that this morning's event will have live captions throughout the event. Um, again, this is our first QCS event of 2023. Um, and personally, I'd like to apologize again for having missed our annual conference in Farmley last December. Unfortunately, COVID finally caught up with me. Um, but I believe it was a really excellent event and a huge thanks to all of the team for the, for the work that went into making that such a success. Um, today actually is a very special event for the network. Today features the launch of the updated customer communications toolkit for services to the public. Um, and again, as a network, we've had the opportunity to have quite a degree of input into the development of the updates to the toolkit. The, the previous one has been a, a really vital guide to us over, over quite a number of years now. The new version 
a lot of the updates were driven by the work that we did um, through our customer service survey in the summer of last year and also the steering group to the to the network provided a lot of critical input too, but that's not to take the credit in any way away from the National Disability Authority and the National Adult Literacy Agency, particularly the NDA, who really led on this work and we're really delighted to have representatives from that body here this morning. Uh, and we have a really, really interesting lineup this morning with senior figures from both the, the National Disability Authority and the National Adult Literacy Agency and who are really going to give us some insights into how the revisions to the toolkit will help to drive what our approach to customer communications is going to look like now and into the future. And, and the one thing about it, I think, is it's hugely practical. Um, and certainly that's what a lot of the work of this network about is really how we can do things. It's many of us have roles in grander policy areas as well, but when we get down to it, this is about the practical interface where public service meets the customer where we strive to meet people's needs on a day-to-day -day basis and this is a hugely important part of that. Just before we hear from the speakers, um, again, just a, a, a welcome to the members of the network today. Every time we have an event, we seem to be setting new records, which is eventually our growth will have to stop. Um, but today we have over 330 people registered to join the event from over 150 public service organizations. Uh, and again, I think that really just shows, I suppose, two things. One is the, the marvelous growth in the network and, and the value the network brings to its members. But also, I think um, I have to acknowledge that particularly good attendance for today's event re reflects the importance of the new toolkit and the launch of it. So again, before we begin, I just want to welcome some new members as well from a number of organisations. We have new members today from the HSE National Recruitment Quality and Standards Team, the National Patient Safety Office in the Department of Health, the Court Service, Talta Erin, and I suppose particular congratulations to Talta Erin on, on the founding of that new body. It's only launched this month. Um, and we look forward to working with you into the future. We have Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. Um, we have some new members from the Citizens Information Board. And obviously, CIV has been a good friend to the network for some time. We have the OGP, Office of Government Procurement, and the team from the Houses of the Arachtis. So again, you're all very welcome and to join the growing family of the Quality Customer Service Network. Again, just before we get into the event, a few practical details here. We are, for our sins, all on WebEx yet again for a virtual meeting. Most of you are probably familiar with the platform of this stage. Just the, the practicalities of it for this event are that your microphone is muted by default um, and your camera. So only the presenters' cameras will be enabled. The presenters will be, um, and, and, and they will be unmuted as, as their turn comes to, to join you for the conversation. That, all of that muting and so on doesn't mean this isn't an interactive session. And again, I think what's the real value of this is the conversation that we have both between members of the network and more particularly this morning between the network and our really excellent panel of guest speakers. So to remind you all, there is the Q&A function. It will typically be to the right of hand side of your screen if you're using the standard screen layout. Um, you can enter in your questions at any time during the event. We can pick up on some of them maybe immediately after individual speakers' presentations, or we can take them at, the, there'll be an open forum discussion at the end of the event, but just not to forget that it is there um, and feel free to put in your thoughts, views, ideas, and questions at any point as the event goes forward. So as I said, we do have a really interesting lineup today. We'll be joined by Dr. Aideen Hartney and James Hubbard from the National Disability Authority, and then later by Donald Fitzpatrick, who's with their Centre for Excellence in Communications. We will also be have Colleen Doobie from the National Adult Literary, Literacy Agency. I do beg your pardon. Um, but before we, we, we hear from those, we had got a launch planned from Minister Ushin Smith. I mean, the Minister very kindly, and, and many of you would be familiar with the Minister as a friend to this network. He has appeared at several of our events. He did very kindly take the time yesterday to record a video message uh, launching the toolkit and is expressing his support for it. Unfortunately, as I said, WebEx can sometimes deliver little glitches. So we've had a problem with getting that video to you this morning. So um, I will just 
briefly paraphrase it by noting the fact that the minister expressed his very strong support for the importance of this. And I think one of the things that came across in his comments and a comment I'd sort of like to make myself is that I suppose universal design is fundamentally important to the quality of the service we deliver. And we often think about it in the context of disability, but it's not. Um, disability is part of the context, obviously, but the key word in this is universal. We are talking about universality. We are talking about services that, be, that can be accessible to every member of our community, irrespective of their linguistic literacy or digital literacy, their bodily ability, um, that everybody can access it. And that is fundamentally important and it makes all our lives easier. So it's it's really, and I think the, the turnout today reflects that. This is, this is not a niche area of conversation. This is something for everybody who's involved in the delivery of public services of any kind. So what we are hoping is we will get the minister's video available online later on today. I know in the background, uh, as ever, the team in Deeper are working frantically to make things happen. Um, so hopefully we will get that to you later on. So it was a joint launch there between the Minister and the National Disability Authority. So we'll move forward then to the NDA and I'm delighted to welcome this morning Dr. Aideen Hartney. Um, Aideen is Director of the National Dis Disability Authority. She became Director in 2020, having joined that organisation in 2016 as its Head of Policy Research and Public Affairs. Aideen's had a long career in overseeing research for the public good, and we're absolutely delighted to have her this morning for the launch of the toolkit. So Aideen, I'm going to hand the floor over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, and, and good morning, everybody. I, I know I'm no substitute for uh, a minister, but I am delighted to be here today on behalf of the National Disability Authority uh, to launch this updated customer communication toolkit for services to the public. Uh, and as Brian was saying, uh, I have the honour of being the director of, of the NDA, and my colleagues James Hubbard and Donald Fitzpatrick are joining me here today. Um, just in case any of you aren't familiar with us, the NDA is a statutory body that provides advice right across government on disability policy, practice and related matters. And within the NDA, we have our Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, which has the very important and challenging role of promoting universal design across government, academia and industry. And its key areas are the built environment, products and services, and ICT systems. Uh, and I think Brian very, um, very articulately um, captured the importance of the universal uh, dimension there uh, in his remarks. Uh, the centre has participated as experts in the development of many standards related to universal design and accessibility. And in fact, our first communications design toolkits were produced way back in 2013 to help implement a national standard on design requirements for communication. And in 2017, those toolkits were adapted for use in the public service and they were co-published with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform, as, as was its title then. And we're very pleased to have continued the collaboration with the Quality Customer Services Network and the Department to keep this toolkit up to date and reflecting the ongoing developments in how services to the public are delivered. And I think we would all be familiar with some of the sea changes uh, that were experienced over the last number of years. So it's, it's very timely to be getting this update out there. And this third edition being launched today aligns with our work to help implement universal design across the public sector, as well as to help any organisation meet related statutory obligations with regard to accessibility. So this updated toolkit will also be useful to our own work in the NDA and particularly in relation to monitoring compliance with the Web Accessibility Directive. The toolkit will likely be part of the accessibility awareness training we offer together with the Irish Computer Society and in our capacity building activities with the OGCIO and the Government Information Service Communications Office, Officers Network. So before I close, uh, let me thank the department um, under its new name, Department of Public Expenditure, NDP Delivery and Reform, it's quite the mouthful, um, for hosting this launch and for their long-term collaboration and commitment to activities related to universal design. 
And we also thank the many organisations and topic experts that offered their time and contribution to inform this update. In addition, I also want to recognise my colleagues at the NDA for their support and work on this update, especially James, who's here with us today, but also Elizabeth O'Mara for all their work with the project team. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand you back now to Brian. Thank you very much, Aideen. Um, it's really interesting to hear you just talk about those link, close links in particular with the Web Accessibility Directive. Um, and I know that the theme of our annual conference in 2021 was digitalization for all. Uh, very strongly reflecting that idea that, I mean, as public services generally, there's a very significant shift towards digitalization and how we deliver services. But with that real concern that's been articulated through this network quite a lot of it, the importance of ensuring that that doesn't leave sections of the community behind and in particular that concern with, with digital literacy and I know the interventions from from the NDA in terms of compliance with the Web Accessibility Directive are something that have been hugely welcomed by many organisations. My, my own and part of my responsibility includes our own web services and I know we've had a very positive engagement, a learning engagement I might add. We were by no means perfect and it was really valuable to have the input from the NDA so, so that's very much appreciated. And I think that relationship with web services is also going to be uh, sort of reflected in what we hear from uh, from our next speaker and also that the whole area of changes in the legislation and the terminology around service delivery. So we're now going to hear from James, as Aideen has mentioned, James Hubbard is Senior Design Advisor for Products and Services at the National Disability Authority's Centre for Excellence in Universal Design. James manages projects to promote universal design through research, education and design guidance and participates in the development of those standards we're discussing. James, you're very welcome. I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, 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 hello all. Pleased to be with you this morning at uh, the Quality Customer Services Network uh, event to launch our newest toolkit. Uh, as mentioned, the um, the development of these toolkits have been going on for, for over 10 years. And uh, uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, I think 2013 was our first one and we were doing uh, early work then in uh, with uh, energy sector, tourism sector, and we had multiple toolkits at that time, uh, broken down into written, verbal and web-based uh, design guidance. And I, I recall this, uh, just a brief story to, to share uh, from chairing one of the meetings, developing the standards. And there was a member of our committee at that time at the National Standards Authority Ireland, and we were developing the first standards related to communication design. And someone shared a story about older older person member of the committee was assisting their mother. Their mother was having difficulty with her electric bill at that time. And the story went that the mother had received an electric bill and paid it, but must have overpaid it and got some sort of a refund or a credit. Well, went ahead and paid that, misunderstanding what it was. And the correspondence went on back and forth three times and she continued to pay the credit and refund and not being able to realize and understand the complicated text, the terminology, the small print and all of that that was causing her difficulty. And so since then, you may have noticed on your electric bill that the font has changed, the color, the size and even the plain English used in the uh, text in the correspondence. So on that day in that committee in those meetings, I was really grateful that we had uh, Nala was with us on that committee. We had representatives from uh, NGOs, most disability uh, organizations represented, industry was there. And so since then, like I say, there's been significant improvements in the way that customer communications have de been developed and produced. And uh, I think that uh, we recognize that uh, this uh, public service toolkit, as uh, 
been very popular. It's uh, it's uh, one of our more popular publications, and we we are aware of many many organizations using this guidance and adopting it, and and we uh, are. Uh, Glad to be involved with this collaboration and continue to update this toolkit and be sure that it stays in alignment with the implementation of the 12 guiding principles of quality customer service. So I have the honor to briefly overview the contents and updates for the new customer communications toolkit for services to the public, a universal design approach. So as I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the many contributors during the project for this update and also I guess we always have to put in a disclaimer because this is design guidance and uh, there's been many, many new publications of different types of design guidance related to communications appearing and particularly uh, for specific sectors for specific populations. So at this point in time, this is a snapshot of uh, representing good practice and uh, alignment with international standards and uh, the uh, information and guidance that aligns us to help us implement those standards and align with uh, regulations. So as displayed on screen is a, is a cover image of the uh, new toolkit. And it would show there that the toolkit is divided into three key sections for written communications design guidance, for spoken and signed guidance, and digital guidance. And uh, it also shows the two logos then from our organization at the uh, Center for Excellence in Universal Design at the National Disability Authority, as well as the logo for the department. Uh, next slide, please. So we have, the next slide is, is showing a, a question for us. Is, so why a communication design toolkit? So we, we know that not all designers of communications will refer to all published regulations and standards as they're designing their communications. This toolkit can help with awareness of related statutory obligations and also for organizations to enjoy the business case benefits uh, that they would derive from uh, making their information and communications accessible for everyone. It can help improve the trust in their organization. It'll reduce miscommunications and misunderstandings. It'll help reduce repeat requests for information. It can improve customer satisfaction and save us all time and money. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, I would cover a bit of, of the background here behind this update. And uh, was mentioned earlier that there were some um, uh, surveys conducted, as well as uh, the NDA is always uh, continuously researching and, and updating information uh, related to policy, regulations, uh, appropriate terminology, and we're involved with international, European, and national standards development uh, in this space. So as we're aware of those changes happening, uh, it was prompted time for, for updating the toolkit just to stay up to date. And uh, we also conducted uh, uh, some rounds of getting feedback from users of the toolkit and, and interested stakeholders. And that prompted a change in the title. And it also prompted to integrate additional information uh, related uh, to uh, procurement. So uh, you, those of you who are familiar with the toolkit, uh, would have remembered the title as associated with uh, a communication toolkit for services uh, for services to the public as a new title versus the earlier title was communication toolkit for the public service so that change was prompted in the change in title by the user's feedback who had an interest that the that the toolkit would be used by organizations in, ad, in addition to only uh, the public sector. And so there was also a request to make some improvements to navigation functions and features inside the, within the document itself. So there, as the slide shows, we've added a glossary. Uh, there's numerous uh, checklists that are in the toolkit. So there's a new index for that list of checklists. Uh, 
In between these two versions of the toolkit, we had published the 2020 uh, uh, tool, uh, toolkit separately uh, designed for accessible meetings, and that was in response to the uh, COVID-19. So that toolkit uh, was a separate supplement, has now been integrated into this update, and it also shows there that we've increased the number of internal hyperlinks within the toolkit as well as uh, 28 external hyperlinks have been added for people to go outside the toolkit to get a, a deeper level of knowledge and information. So next slide. This slide shows a couple of extract images from the toolkit uh, that are about how the toolkit aligns with the universal design approach and how the toolkit is suggested to be used. So those who are familiar with the 150 page toolkit will appreciate that many of the visual graphic examples have been retained as well as the tip boxes, the learn more boxes, and uh, that the many self-assessment checklists and question sets are, are embedded tools to test if your communication can be accessed, understand, understood and used. So as it shows here, the examples, tips, checklists, links in the toolkit they're intended to be used for planning, for training, uh, to help inform procurement activities. And just to remind, the toolkit is uh, uh, published and structured in a way that it's intended to be used in parts and pieces. Uh, for example, the spoken and sign section of the toolkit would have some checklists that would be very helpful to be printed out as a separate single page, to be posted next to maybe a reception desk, for communicating face-to-face -face with the public or your customers. Uh, whereas some of the, the content in the written sections or the digital sections may be something you may want to attach to use with the contractor who's preparing uh, your communications for you. So those are many ways you can use that. And as it shows there also that it, the objective is, is that a communication should be able to be accessed, understood, and used. And that's a direct extract from the definition of universal design. And so go to the next slide, please. What I wanted, before I go, I wanted to share why there's this text in the title. The title is called the Universal Design Approach. And we understand that designs need to be accessed, understand, and used. And we wanted to share this universal design approach one of the key things that can be used to complement any design process uh, is to consider this approach is key to universal design. The images shown on this slide show that it's recommended to oversample the people or the participants, the use, intended users. Uh, you would oversample the people that are at the tails of a distribution curve, those people who may be representing and we'd want to prioritize the, the users of the toolkit uh, and the users of your communication, those people with the more diverse abilities, characteristics, and preferences. So the next slide, please. And then I'll, uh, I'll just finish by saying that the universal design is, is based on seven principles and 29 guidelines. And so we encourage you to allow the 29, seven principles to inspire unique, easy to use design solutions and to apply the 29 universal design guidelines to inform their criteria in your design development process. And uh, last slide. And the last slide in closing, I say uh, thank the project team and the many topic experts for their participation and involvement. And it, uh, the slide shows the question, where do I find the toolkit? So the 2023 communication toolkit is hosted as an accessible printable PDF, and it's also hosted as an accessible HTML version, uh, and is just currently put up on our uh, on our website at universaldesign.ie forward slash communications toolkit, and is uh, currently being added to uh, the ops.gov.ie communications toolkit uh, webpage. So uh, I also just to indicate that we've just noticed a couple of small errors in uh, some of the accessible formatting. 
on the, in the accessible PDF and the HTML version, and those are in the process of being corrected uh, uh, over the next day or so. So what uh, what is on the web page is uh, usable for printing and for most users and an error that we've identified just shows us the example how universal design is is based on continuous improvement and so we'll continually improve and check and retest these uh, documents and attachments on our web page to be sure that over the next few days we can get them perfect uh, with that uh, i'll turn you back over to brian that's great. Thank you very much, James. And thank you. Thank you for those insights. And I think your your conclusion around continuous improvement is a sort of a really valuable place for us all to kind of to hang on to. I mean, one thing that struck me, I mean, you talk about there's 150 pages, 29 universal guidelines, seven principles and so on. It's a very comprehensive document. You have those three different in interlocking areas of the spoken and signed, the written, the digital. Um, there's probably a message in there too i think for people that you don't have to swallow this all at once and you did mention there's a modular nature to this um and i think that's probably very important too because um people might be just a little bit intimidated by the overall size of the package um but i take it there is we can all dip in and out of the relevant portions as as and when the need arises for us uh, that's correct great observation yeah. James, I, I, one thing that really struck me when you were talking there was that that um, example you had from the the energy bills, uh, and I think what it rang a chord with me and is because I, I, an awful lot of our colleagues around the network as well are in very technical environments, and and very often technical people almost feel that you cannot reduce their complex work. And if you think about the energy bills and you're into MPRNs and GPRNs and cubic meters and kilowatt hours and all this sort of stuff I, i'm kind of interested in in the extent to which people in technical environments embrace or or are they intimidated by the challenge to simplify to clarify to use plain english to get clear messages out is is, is the resistance or are people embracing this would you say a, a, a great question a great point to elaborate on brian thank you uh I, uh, the the anecdote that I shared about the uh, an older person uh, having difficulty interpreting uh, their electric bill and their refund and their repaying that in the credit and making a, a payment on that again and and taking quite some time for uh, her son to get that all sorted uh, through many hours of being held on hold and dealing with customer services and getting corrections on accounts. So you can imagine it was quite an anecdote at the time that really helped our standards committee uh, as we were developing some of this first guidance and collecting this all. A standard has a set of requirements in it, but the, uh, the back part of a standard is usually a set of annexes with a lot of design guidance. So that design guidance from the standards turned into these toolkits. Uh, to go further on your point there, uh, I think maybe many of us can remember some years ago where you would uh, be looking at some uh, instruction manuals for products or information that was quite apparently written and developed and written and published by the very technical people involved with that product and many of that is much of that is beginning to change. So products and services, and this whole uh, uh, thing about confusion of information, complication, uh, inappropriate use of terminology, inconsistent uh, terminology being used. And we're so grateful to have uh, plain English uh, through NALA involved in this project. It's really helped us uh, publishing this document and obviously bringing together uh, that kind of um, uh, what uh, I'm sure they'll share about getting the uh, understanding the message the first time, right? And the information. So it's about information, uh, uh, preparation, communication, two-way uh, communication, and being sure that we're uh, we're understanding each other and and the information is prepared. One of the key points, also, uh, you'll pick up from this toolkit, and we emphasize it again further, is that. 
all information should be provided in multiple formats. So an organization should be ready to do that. And we all know that if we're getting our information in uh, multiple ways simultaneously or in alternate ways as we need it, it's just more likely that we're not going to be excluding uh, any of the, the people that uh, may be needing uh, those kind of uh, alternatives. So yes, things are improving and it's great to see the changes happening. That's terrific. Thank you very much, James. And I think you, you, you've segued us very nicely into the next section of the morning um, when you touched on that whole area of plain language. Um, and certainly I know that's something that's been championed tremendously by Nala over many years. Uh, as I say, I, I raised the technical point there because I, I, was, I work in a tax environment and we've had the same challenges with, and I've had colleagues who get quite angrily tell me that there's simply no way that the complex legal concepts around inheritance and capital acquisitions tax and they throw phrases at you like residual legatee and tell you you can't make that into plain english uh and it's i, th I think with a lot of assistance from nala we've actually been i think quite successful in that but it's an ongoing battle as i say so so thanks again to yourself james as i said you've, you've very much teed up i think our, our next speaker Colleen Doobie. Colleen is Chief Executive Officer at the National Adult Literacy Agency, Ireland. And I think I've been slipping into the same thing of just tossing out the terminology without explaining it up to now, uh, just using the acronym NALA. But I think it is well known to a lot of our, our members around the network. Colleen has held quite a number of leadership roles in the Irish civil and public service since 1990, very much focused on ensuring equity and access and probably nowhere more so than in her current role at the National Adult Literacy Agency, NALA. And NALA itself has played a very important role in, in shaping updates to this toolkit. And I now invite Colleen just to speak to us to discuss why and how we can develop literary, liter literacy I sometimes struggle with that word myself, literacy friendly public services and how NALA can help us all in that. And just before I give the floor to NALA, can I just remind people, by the way, that the um, you have the Q&A function there on your screen. If anybody wants to put in a question to any of our speakers or a comment, um, feel free to do so. As I say, we have only over 300 people registered with us this morning. So far, you're all quite shy. So please don't be shy. This is an open forum for communication among friends. We look forward to hearing from you. So I'll go back to Colleen now. I think your slides are lined up, so I'll hand the floor over to you. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks so much, Brian. And technology has just decided not to cooperate with me and the screen has just vanished. So hopefully give me a second and see if I can actually find you guys all again. I'm not sure what happened. Um, while I'm trying to multitask that, firstly, just again to say, um, thank you um, for kind of the invitation today. Um, and interestingly, I started my journey um, in the civil service um, in um, at a time when there was the strategic management initiative. Um, so that goes back a long, long time. And, and interestingly, um, I, I suppose my, as you said, my kind of career with, with NALA in, and various roles I had has, has kind, of, kind of come into a really in, interesting intersection because my background is actually as as an art historian. Um, so for me, um, the power of the visual is really important. Um, and I think in, in, the cur in our current climate, it's becoming even more and more important. So I think, as, as James said, the need for us to be able to communicate um, through multiple channels, the kind of what we know kind of in terms of omni-channel um, forms of communication is becoming more and more important. And, and I suppose what I'd like to emphasize today is, is really how we collectively um, can create a literacy friendly um, Ireland. So as, as Brian said, my name is Colleen Dewey and I'm Chief Executive of um, the National Adult Literacy Agency. Similar to Aideen, I had the privilege of, of joining NALA um, in 2020, right in the middle of COVID. So I've even learned all new ways of communicating in the last kind of couple of years. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here today to 
to help launch uh, the toolkit and really, um, as Breen said, can't take credit for the tremendous work that has gone into this um, third edition of the toolkit. Um, I've been able to avail of it myself in, in, in previous um, roles, but it really is to stand here on the sh shoulder of giants who, who have participated in this process. Um, I'd like to thank my colleague, um, Claire O'Reardon, who's with us today, who coordinates our Plain English service and really, you know, she was the representative of NALA throughout these pro these kind of conversations, along with Nora O'Donnell, who's is, is floating behind the scenes, um, pulling, uh, herding all the cats today, um, as well as James and, and his colleague, Liz Amara. So I said, we're, we're delighted um, that, that this toolkit is out today. And for those of you who don't know, the, the previous version of this in 2019 did want, win the NALA um, Mason Hayes and Curran Plain English Award. So let's see um, what awards this, this toolkit will, will scoop. So I think as, as Aideen said, it is coming at a very timely moment as, as government rolls out several strategies, um, including the adult literacy for life strategy that we're very involved in to ensure that there's active engagement, inclusion of everyone, as we said, that kind of the importance of universality in our country and our communities. So I'd like to take my time today to tell you a little bit about who is uh, the National Adult Literacy Agency and why we all should collectively create a literacy friendly society. So as, as detailed here, I'll be covering who, who, who are we, why do we exist, um, which gives you a set of the context of, of literacy in Ireland. Um, what is our understanding of literacy? I think as Breen said, it is a bit of a mouthful. So I'd like to kind of unpack that a little bit in terms of when you, when you hear it mentioned, you, you kind of have a sense of what we're talking about and what we do um, in NALA. And as I said, maybe some ideas about in addition to this toolkit, other things that we can do to create a literacy friendly society in Ireland and where if you're if you're interested, in addition to kind of looking at the toolkit, where else you can go for further information. So firstly, who is NALA? Um, NALA, we're actually entering middle age. Um, we're currently approaching 50. Um, and we, so we were kind of founded in 1980. We're actually a registered charity and a company limited by guarantee. Um, so as I think maybe in response to Breen's question, um, I spend a lot of my time um, in kind of the what I call the governance grind. Um, and the reality is that we could spend the rest of this presentation talking about, you know, do we need all that really complicated language? Um, the regular Regulators will tell us so, but we know in NALA you can boil a lot of this down to very simple English, and I'll give you a little bit of an example of that later on. Um, and we are a members-based organization. We have close to 2,000 members, um, the majority in Ireland, but also internationally. We receive uh, the majority of our funding from SOLAS, um, the Further and Education Training Authority, and with additional funding from various EU projects, our Plain English Service, membership fees and donations. Um, we currently have 27 staff and are actively including so if anybody's interested in joining this bandwagon have a look at our website so maybe just to give you a little bit of context about why NALA exists because the we, we like to pride ourselves in Ireland as being a land of saints and scholars. And while that is true, there's a different reality. And that reality is that for one in six adults in Ireland today, um, which is about 530,000 adults, um, reading everyday texts such as bus timetables, medical instructions, um, is very hard to read and understand. I think James gave that example of utility bills, um, and, and that, that is a really pressing concern for a lot of people. And those, those figures come from a survey, an international survey that was done in 2012 um, called the Programme for Assessment and Adult Competencies, known as PIAC for short, which was conducted in Ireland um, by, the, by the Central Statistics Office. The current survey, because um, that data is about 10 years old, but we try and update it with then um, current CSO educational attainment. Um, we have been relying on that data since 2012, and, and the new updated PIAC is actually in the field at the moment, and we hope to have those results in, in 2024. But the reality is, as I said, you know, the, these statistics create really real everyday challenges for individuals in Ireland and, and individuals engaging um, with services, be them delivered by the public and, and uh, sector, but also the private sector. And those challenges become even more acute when we look at unmet numeracy and digital literacy needs. So once again, based on that 2012 study, uh, one in four of Irish adults or about 750,000 individuals struggle with basic maths tax tasks, so such as trying to figure out the kilowatt usage on your bill and working out, um, you know, all those calculations or very basic things in terms of working out discounts 
or medicine um, dosages or dividing bills. And we're currently hearing from many of our students and individuals that this is causing um, major challenges trying to manage their finances and bills, regardless of whether they're in plain English or not. And, and unfortunately, when we look at digital skills, the picture is even scarier. Um, according to the 2020 CEDAPOP study, there's actually about 40%, I'll, I'll pause on that, 40% of Irish adults have basic digital skills uh, issues. And, and, and that means using a mouse, using a keyboard, logging on. Um, and we're trying to create a high tech society, but the reality is, as many people know, we're not teaching digital skills in our primary curriculum, our secondary curriculum, or our third level, but yet we're expecting people um, to engage in digital first services or walk into high tech jobs. Um, and, and then we have a lot of services that are being delivered online, such as your passport or your driver's license or banking. So this is hugely significant um, for individuals um, and organizations that are trying to develop and deliver um, digital first or digital available policies. So as, as James said, we do need to keep those statistics in mind and consider what are the alternatives. Um, recent research um, by ourselves um, in, in final financial literacy space um, was launched in December 2020. And we also just recently published, um, we um, offer a student development fund. And, and those findings were revealing that people are having more and more um, challenges um, engaging digitally, particularly with connectivity um, challenges, capability challenges, and then, and uh, you know, incorrect or badly created content. So this toolkit um, and, and the various government strategies will bridge some of these gaps, but we need to do our part to make information and services as accessible as possible as we simultaneously try and offer upskilling opportunities. So I'd like to very briefly tell you about, as I said, our understanding of literacy and what we do um, in that space. So literacy involves both technical skills of communication, so what we know is the reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, but also using everyday um, technology to communicate and handle information. But it also includes personal, social, and economic dimensions. Literacy increases individuals and communities' potential to reflect on their situation. It allows individuals to explore new possibilities, initiate change, and participate fully in family, community, society, and work opportunities. The next slide shows this kind of what our definition of, of literacy and what it means visually. So in the center of that, what we call kind of the virtuous circle of, of literacy, you have the individuals with kind of the, the appropriate literacy, numeracy and digital skills that, that they need and to engage in work, health and well-being, social and community and, and family in those outer quadrants. And then all of us here who are engaged in um, trying to support public policy, public services and those and 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 work opportunities and 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 other kind of educational opportunities in those those outer quadrants um, are ever more um, needing to take account of that person in the individual and the toolkit that's being launched today will ensure that all of you that exist you know to a certain extent in those outer outer sections can engage as effectively and accessibility with every individual in the center of that literacy wheel so what i'd like to just you know tell you a little bit about is is the actual work we do in nala so what is our vision and we sp we've spoken already today about the importance of universality and and we believe that literacy is a human right Everyone should have the, the opportunity to develop their literacy, numeracy and digital skills so that they can take fully part in society and however they define that, whether there's workplace or, or, or family or just every day. So our mission is to create and to advocate for literacy as a human right, collaborate with a range of partners to influence policy and practice to support the development of literacy, numeracy and digital skills. And our purpose um, is to support adults with unmet literacy, numeracy and digital needs who are furthest behind by raising awareness of those needs and supporting the delivery of literacy friendly services in Ireland. So how do we do that? As I said, similar to that wheel that I showed you previously, we keep individuals with the literacy needs in the centre of what we do. And there's kind of three primary pillars um, to what we do. Firstly, through through the funding that we get through SULIS, we're supporting the implementation of the further education and training and the adult literacy for life strategy. We also undertake and promote research and best practice. And then we support organizations and society, particularly by um, promoting literacy friendly 
services and our plain English service. And we also undertake a range of um, educational opportunities. We have a, a, an e-learning platform called Learn with Nala that is designed with universal design principles where there's 42 courses on offer where individuals either individually or in um, a blended learning setting um, can earn um, a certificates and or go on to get up to level three qualifications. We are the biggest provider of um, level three, or sorry, of QQI qualifications under level four in, in Ireland. Um, and then we also offer free phone service. I won't go through the huge extent of what we do, but that just gives you a flavor of, of our activities. So now I would just like to kind of zone in on the really practical um, actions that we can all take with, with this toolkit and, and, and in additionally to build a literacy friendly Ireland and a literacy friendly public service. Um, I mentioned um, already um, our plain English and editing service and we also offer literacy awareness training. Um, so I'd like to spend a little bit of time just kind of focusing on, on these two elements. So the, so the next slide, please, Nora. The literacy awareness training, um, we offer free online webinars. So you have a look at our website, www.nala.ie. You will find those and they tend to be offered a couple of times a month. Um, and they cover what do we need by unmet needs in Ireland, how you might be able to provide a literacy friendly service with some tips and standards and how you can further support um, adults with unmet literacy needs. And we also have um, an e-learning course, um, Learn with Nala, which is on our Learn with Nala platform called Understanding Adult Literacy, Numeracy and Digital Literacy Needs. And I've sent the link to the, the network, so hopefully that might appear on the website um, and you'll find that there going forward. Currently, we are providing literacy awareness training. Uh, Brian mentioned earlier about kind of the technocrats um, and the legal eagles. We, we do every year present literacy awareness training to the Law Society, also to Libraries Citizen Information Bureau. And I know many of them are here today, are, are great kind of customers and clients and collaborators of ours. Um, and, and, and if you haven't availed of our literacy awareness training, would encourage you to do so. Um, we also, and it's been mentioned already, our plain English service. Um, and Claire O'Riordan is with us today, um, who heads up that service. So that includes editing documents for organizations, providing training, um, um, undertaking research and advocacy, and collaborating on projects such as, as, as this toolkit. Um, so what I'd like to do now is maybe just for those of you who aren't familiar with plain English or haven't had an opportunity to do a speed read of uh, the toolkit to explain what do we mean by plain English and plain language. Um, so the um, International um, Plain Language Federation definition of uh, plain language is a communication it, it is in plain language if its wording, structure and design are so clear that the attendant readers can easily find what they need, understand what they need and use that information. So once again, as um, James mentioned, the accessibility, the understanding and the using is, is, is key to, to that definition. So how can we all create a literacy friendly Ireland? Here are top two or top five tips. So. Think of the person, you know, and, and as James mentioned, you know, think of people outside of that bell curve. You know, you want to be able to um, think of those persons when you're writing and, you, and, you're, and, and you're communicating. Be as personal and direct as possible. Be, use the we and the you. Try, try to create a bit of, you know, personal um, connection um, with whoever that audience is. Keep it simple. Define or spell out um, unavoidable jargon and abbreviations and, and keep sentences to an average of 15 to 20 words. Um, so I'm going to give you an example. Um, I think we're, we're overburdened by um, US inputs here, <laughs> but um, this is one and I'll just read this out um, from the US and you might be thinking about in what context this was delivered. I've concluded that the director has exhibited a serious deficiency in judgment involving matters contained in the report and that he does not command the respect and confidence needed to lead the Bureau and the law enforcement community in addressing the main issues facing law enforcement today. You might do a little quiz in the quiz. Who do you think said then the plain ling language version of that? Next slide, please. He wasn't doing a good job. And this was in the context of the FBI director, um, Comey, that, and, and Trump, Regrettably or not, is a master of plain language, um, keeping, it, keeping it simple. We might not like what he says, but he does use plain language. Um, so how can we create um, a literacy-friendly Ireland? And this, I won't go into the, the, the totality of this example, but this is a recent project that we've been working with with Dunleary Rathdown, 
housing department um, and um, it, it has resulted and I think James mentioned this the kind of the business case um, for for using the toolkit and plain language and all that's in it um, that you know for Dunleary um, housing department it resulted in 15 percent fewer maintenance requests and that was because they were able to kind of communicate to their tenants um, how to avail of repairs in a quicker way and and this went through kind of three phases um, where they you know they, they surveyed as you know once again as James you know talked about surveyed their users what did their users need did plain English audits um, created um, a, a, a plain English policy and they created plain language and English champions new documents and now they're into kind of the third stage of that and, and looking at how they can align um, their their future activities with kind of international kind of standards and it and it, and it did result in the the um, project being case studied um, in the Irish public administration administration resource and was shortlisted for a Chambers Ireland reward. So that's one really practical example of a kind of how a root and branch approach to, to plain language. So really I just kind of, kind of wrap up um, and just say in terms of what, what do we do next? I think we do need to as, as James said, constantly be reviewing, assessing and enhancing. There's new standards coming out all the time. There's a lot of lingo out there. And um, when we speak about plain English language, easy to read, universal design, and it, it's really to understand um, what the differences between all of those are, but what the possible interactions. We would be recommending and encouraging that there is more research and particularly user testing um, to see the impact of you know, the toolkit, plain language and, and, and plain English, so that we do really understand um, how we can um, create further enhancements, um, particularly in a, an information technology and visually saturated um, world. And we would um, respectfully request that the government honour its, its programme of government commitment to do, introduce a plain language requirement on all public service communication so people can understand information for the first time they read or hear it. I would be advocating having previously worked um, in course of Elga in the Irish language space and that we would take kind of a similar approach to the Official Languages Act um, that we, and Nala had recommended previously that the, and there was a bill in terms of a, a plain language act but still you know to adopt that approach that there would be um, plain language advocates and champions in every organization um, so that we can em embed this and cascade this um, down. So once again I would just like to um, congratulate um, all the hands and heads, mouths and minds that went into producing this toolkit. Thank you all for listening um, and ask you um, what you can do in your organisation to be a bit more literacy aware and friendly. And please do have a look at our website um, for further information, www.nala.ie, or please get in touch with myself or Claire if you have any more questions about how we can support you on your literacy friendly journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colleen. That was a really fascinating insight into, I suppose, the literacy challenges people face. Though for me, I think the big takeaway from your presentation was that um, the model that all public servants should hold up for excellence in communication is one Donald J. Trump. It's 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 this it's a sad fact um, of the world we live in that um, he he has zoned in on the importance of clear, concise communications um it is, it and, is a, a sad fact of life yes and i think i think the lesson in it though is that <laughs> um where where the rest of us fail a donald trump can fill that void um and i suppose that that's probably the more valuable takeaway from that in the sense that um and because there are always actors in the market who will fill the space that public servants should be filling um and and the other thing that struck me actually, I was one of your one in four, um, you mentioned people struggling with discount and I suddenly had the flashback to last Sunday and I was standing in my local super value looking at eggs and it was 10 for 330 free range eggs and then there was some other, it was 12 for whatever it was, 380 or 90 or something and I was desperately trying to work, do my maths on the spot to work out what was the actual unit price and where was I getting better value? Um, and again, obviously, that's interesting because it's coming from an organization that doesn't necessarily want me to fully understand the choices that I have. But again, for us as public servants, clearly, I mean, our 
a, or a core part of our business is communication. So we do want people to fully understand so we can take those lessons and, and turn them around um, and, 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 and try and present things differently. What, one thing that interested me, Colleen, because I knew when we were talking to, to Aideen earlier and Aideen, her body has a statutory remit, it is an authority. Um, so they set standards and there's an element of auditing and so on. If I understand correctly, you're more in the supportive and facilitative mode or do you have enforcement or? No, we don't. We are a charity and, and, and I think there there is a bit of maybe misnomer in the fact our, our name as an agency, but strictly speaking, you know, we don't have you know, statutory um, powers or something. But um, one of the activities that NALA does engage in is working collaboratively with agencies to conduct audits, you know, if they're, if they're interested. And, and it really is, you know, not to kind of come in and, uh, you know, pay, pay, I suppose, kind of maybe the, the school teacher role, but really to kind of look at what organizations are doing well and commend them for that and say, you know, you might consider doing this um, given, you know, whoever your users are. Um, so we we have in the past, and that would be some of the work that the, the Plain English Service does as well, is looking at documents and saying, okay, some of this is working, you might consider doing this. Similarly, with the literacy friendly approach, and I've mentioned some of our work with kind of local authorities, and um, we're currently doing some work with the Horse Racing Ireland um, in terms of just once again, because there's a huge amount of kind of regulation in that industry at the moment and, and how do they um, maybe kind of make their um, workers and, you know, the grooms and the jockeys all maybe upskill everybody in terms of that process. So we, we conduct audits, but it's in more in trying kind of a process enhancement way as opposed to an enforcement way. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. And I suppose, again, do you, are you welcome? Um, or, or do sometimes people react as if, look, we think we think we're good at communicating. Here's Colleen coming in and telling us we're not. Um, by and large, what would you know? Uh, yeah. So uh, by and large, what tends to happen is most of the organisations that get in touch with us are already what we would call maybe on kind of the literacy friendly journey themselves or kind of the universal design user center. Um, and it, it would be organizations that have a, um, you know, have a public agreement in the, in the, the private and the public sector. And they, they just know that they, there's something more they can do. Um, and they may be conscious um, that they want to make their um, services a little bit more accessible. They might not have kind of thought about it. It's about literacy. It, it, they are coming to it from, accessibility, universal design, and, and we just give, and I suppose, an added value. So by and large, most people are um, kind of contacting us. Um, we're not usually beating down people's doors to get, to get in, but that being said, and you meant, you know, in answer to your question at the start, um, are people reluctant? I, my experience has been, um, uh, to a certain extent, the legal um, sector will say, no, no, we cannot translate all of this into plain language. The reality is they can. Um, the question is, it takes away a bit of their USP and mystery if, if they do and their fee structure. Um, the, the reality is a lot of, you know, pretty much everything and everything can be translated into plain language. And what we're finding even increasingly with our interactions with financial services, um, they're, they're caught between a rock and a hard place in that they, they are very conscious that customers get into points of vulnerability um, in their lives um, and they want to make information as accessible as possible. But the challenge they have is the regulators. The regulators are saying then that you have to communicate all this information and all the, this regulatory detail to your customers. And a lot of it, it's a, it's a timing issue. And that, this is one of the conversations we're having um, with the central bank at the moment as part of the consumer review of consumer protection code is that Financial institutions need to be enabled and be given time to be able to translate regulation into accessible formats and um, kind of documentation and, and as James said, omni-channel. A lot of times they don't have that time. So there's a real willingness, particularly amongst the financial institutions that we've been engaging with to do that. But they say to us, our hands are tied by the regulators. So this is part of a conversation we're now having with the central bank as part of the review of the Consumer Protection Code. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that is, I think that's really fascinating. The, the very idea that uh, the requirements of a regulatory body 
could unintentionally undermine the accessibility aspects of, of parts of, in, in this case, financial services, um, uh, when their, their objective clearly is to vindicate and uphold people's rights. Um, but you have one set of rights maybe conflicting a little bit with another, um, but it's more about time. There's no, there's no ultimate conflict here, I think, is what you're saying. No, but what, what has happened and one of the, the, the big challenges that has, has emerged, particularly um, in, in banking, is um, as a result of anti-money laundering legislation and the requirements for identification and various things, that that is having a knock-on effect for individuals, be them Ukrainian residents or individuals who are here to four, haven't had a passport, don't have a PPS number, how can they actually get a bank account? So once again, the financial institutions are caught between a rock and a hard place because the anti-money laundering reg regulation requires a um, photo ID and you have individuals then who are arriving in Ireland, you know, be it, you know, in international protection, whatever, they don't have it. And then there, there are still a range of, of in, individuals in Ireland that do not have um, idea. And we went through that whole kind of um, challenge with the PPN card. And anyway, so once again, that that's a historic regulation for very valid reasons. But the knock on Im implications, given the change in context, has created a bottleneck, which requires legislation to undo. So yeah, there, and as, as, as James said, we're constantly having to review where we are in terms of, you know, policy, legislation, provision for the reality and, and how do we adapt to those circumstances to make sure that everybody can access services that they need. Great. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, and, and, and as I say, it's, it's, it's a conversation we might come back to because I think that that interaction between the sort of, let's say, the vindicating and upholding of different types of rights and but the need to balance that is is is, is challenging and it's kind of maybe in some ways where it makes this just that little bit more difficult. I think, you know, the, there's probably nobody in the audience or nobody who's going to sort of fundamentally not subscribe to the concept of universal design and universal access, but there are these, I suppose, wrinkles within the process. And I'm sort of feeling a pang of guilt having been involved in some of the anti-money laundering regulations myself a number of years ago. Um, and because again, you're thinking with a different lens, you're thinking of investors, you're thinking about moneyed people, and you're thinking about sort of criminality and risk that you're trying to manage. Um, but clearly there's, there's this other lens. And I think, again, I suppose this is part of the value of an event like this is um, particularly for, for the few hundred people who are with us who are involved in customer services, that just having that additional lens to always think about the accessibility piece. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's bringing, and we've in, in our conversations with the financial institutions <clears throat> and, and, you know, we've heard kind of the stories of individuals trying to kind of, you know, change from either Ulster Bank um, or any of the banks that are leaving into the, and, and how problematic that has been. By and large, um, the, the banks all have workarounds and they have accommodations for individuals. They don't necessarily publicize that because they don't want everyone availing of it because that, then that does create kind of inherent risks in terms of fraud and various things. And, and, and I suppose it's what we would be arguing and, and to echo what, what James said earlier, you know, particularly in relation to the delivery of, of public services where everyone is still kind of remote working and or there's a move to digital, being mindful of those individuals that perhaps are on the other side of the bell curve, that there, there, there need to be alternative ways of interacting um, with services um, and, and keeping that to the forefront of your mind. So remembering those people, you know, the, the, those statistics that I shared, the people, and if you are designing, you know, services um, that you do keep those individuals in mind. And sometimes if you start from that point of view in terms of the design, it'll be accessible for everyone. Great. Thanks, Colleen. I think that's a, that's a really good point to close that section on. Um, Thank you. And it certainly focuses on, 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 on that idea. And, and again, it goes back to that concept that as we, particularly as we build increasingly digital services, um, that the literacy point and that 40% of adults um, with fundamental digital literacy problems is something that I think is, is a really far more important takeaway from than the um, valuable lessons from Donald Trump and how to communicate. Um, 
I'm going to move on now uh, to Donald Fitzpatrick. And Donald is, um, Donald, you're very welcome. Donald brings us both his insights as a designer, but also insights from the lived experience of, of a service user. Donald is Senior ICT Design Advisor at the Center for Excellence in Universal Design, um, which is part of the NDA. Donald engages in work on policy across the digital domain. And again, that term digital keeps coming up because clearly that's the becoming so much the dominant part of service design at this stage. Donald has collaborated extensively with higher education institutions in the area of universal design for the delivery of education. Um, but today he's going to speak to us about his lived experience of how universal design can improve communications and interactions with public service organizations and bring us some examples from the world of digital communication. So Donald, delighted to hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. It's great to be with you this morning for the launch of this really important uh, toolkit. And again, I'd like to extend my congratulations and appreciation to the various colleagues across many departments, uh, including, of course, the, the NDA and the C Centre for Excellence in Universal Design for their excellent work on this. It's a, it's a, it's a great achievement and a great piece of work. Um, you're right. I'm going to talk to you about some examples of my own uh, lived experience. I should explain that I am totally blind. So I'm sitting here today, uh, not only listening to the excellent discussion that we've had thus far, but I'm actually uh, reading my speaking notes using what we call a screen reader. So my computer is actually talking to me as well as uh, everything else. I could use Braille. I happen to be a one of the blind people um, who read Braille. Not every blind person does. Uh, but I've chosen today to use speech just purely and simply for convenience. And I think it's worth, if I may, starting off this by looking at some of the key points uh, in the toolkit. I mean, uh, we've just recently heard there in, in the last section of this particular uh, talk this morning about the importance of plain language. Um, and I think that very much ties in with, with my experience, both plain language and the availability of uh, alternative formats. I can give you an anecdotal kind of example of this. Um, and it might seem somewhat unusual because it's not digital, but it, it, it highlights the alternative format and the usefulness of alternative formats. Next time you go into a pharmacy, perhaps take a look at, I don't know, a box of paracetamol, or if you happen to have children, a bottle of Calpol. And you might see on the bottle, uh, basically as, as, as my, my son calls it, daddy's bumpy writing, Braille. And that's very, very useful because it's, it's come out over the last 15, 20 years from the European Union that medicine uh, containers must also have Braille labeling on them. So it's available in print, it's available in Braille. Now this works really well until, for example, you might order a prescription and the box comes out and uh, unfortunately, somebody has decided to stick a sticky printed label over the Braille part of, the, of the, the box. So what this highlights is two things. One, the importance, if you like, of having information in alternative formats, the usefulness of it, you know, having the information in Braille. But equally, it's knowing how to actually present and offer that particular alternative format. In this particular instance, to go back to the anecdote, it's very important, for example, that those who are preparing the, the, the prescription boxes are made aware that they shouldn't put a sticky label over the Braille on the box. Now, equally, that goes back to the provision, for example, another recent example from, from, from my life was uh, I needed to assist a relative who has low digital literacy with applying for a grant for something. And they had, as they quite rightly should, obtained the information in printed form. So I asked for a copy in Word of the information, which was provided, and that enabled me to go through it, highlight the parts that I felt were read, readily useful to this particular individual, print it out again and hand it and say, okay, I've underlined now the parts of this that are relevant to you. The other pages are for a different uh, funding scheme, it uses the same application form, but we don't need to worry about that. Just read this particular information. So that provision of information to me in an alternative and accessible format as this toolkit advocates. And 
It also means you have to think about who your communication is for. We just heard again the importance of plain language, thinking about who your target audience actually are. What I find from lived experience is that when the information is provided to me in an accessible format, it improves my interaction with organizations. For example, if I can readily read and apprehend the information in an accessible format, I can then, my queries are more directed. I know where to go on the, in respect of the, the organization providing the service to obtain the service that I specifically need. If the information supporting an application form is accessible, it helps me in actually completing that application form, assuming it, of course, is accessible. Interesting kind of supports. What, what supports can actually help this? Well, you have chat functions. So make sure your chat function, for example, on your, on, on your web interfaces, your mobile apps are all accessible. Um, on the phone, is it easy to actually get through on the phone? Um, somebody mentioned earlier about being on hold for extended periods of time. This can be very, very difficult. Captions, digital audio. We have it here today. We're using a digital platform with captions enabled. This supports a wide range of users who for all kinds of reasons may require that particular uh, access to, to the, the, the conversation this morning. What's also very useful about this is, is a digital section of uh, the toolkit really will help you in uh, adhering and being compliant with web accessibility directive. As you know, and was mentioned before, this mandates and requires public sector bodies to ensure that their websites, mobile apps, and indeed most content are, are accessible. And using the universally designed approaches recommended in the toolkit will definitely in help to ensure that your communications uh, are, are, are compliant with uh, the Web Accessibility Directive. What I would say about Web Accessibility is that it allows everybody to perceive, operate, and understand uh, all sorts of web uh, platforms and, and, and content. In my case, when a website is properly structured, properly formatted, properly developed to ensure its optimal accessibility, it means that I can interact with that particular content, avail of the services, acquire the information that I need in the same way as somebody who is not using the assistive technology that I use. The last point I would like to make with your permission this morning is very much around the role of this, uh, is the role of this in, in terms of the, the private sector. You know, we have had just spoken about the Web Accessibility Directive in terms of the public sector. Well, it's also very, very important that private sector organizations will, who provide uh, services to the public, ensure that their communications are accessible as well. And indeed, there are many situations where awards are given for properly universally designed uh, content and websites. For example, the Spider Awards recently, we are delighted to sponsor an award with the Spider Awards in the area of universal design. We also work closely with our colleagues at the Irish Design Institute, the IDI, and I'm delighted to lead out on an award category for students called the Universal Design Grand Challenge, which encourages students to engage in designs that foster and focus on a universally designed approach to making products, services, and environments inclusive. Thank you very much for listening to me this morning. I hope the little examples that I've given you have illustrated in some form the importance of ensuring that your communications are inclusive and as accessible as possible. And once again, my congratulations to all involved in the production of this third edition of the toolkit. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donald. Yeah, and that's, I think your your practical examples are what really bring the day to life for us because, I mean, these things can be a theoretical conversation, but you, you, you've really got us there. I, I have to say I enjoyed Daddy's Mumpy writing as a, as a wonderful description of Braille, but um, I, I've noticed it beginning to turn up. And I'm, I see my local park now has signs around the trees um, with, with Braille as well. Um, I, I don't know if 
you're, you're, you're probably obviously much more aware of it than I would be. Is there a substantial growth or am I just happen to live in an area that sort of seems to have embraced it? I think it's there. I think we went through, it was very interesting you should raise this because we did go through uh, an era where, believe it or believe it not, um, blind people were actually discouraged from using Braille and in favour of audio. Um, now what's actually happening is, is a recognition that Braille as a form of communication is as, as valid as anything else. So. I think it's I think it's certainly making a comeback, but we did go through a phase where people generally who weren't blind, by the way, were saying, oh, no, no, use audio. It's cheaper and it's you can get everything you need from from audio. But if, if we go back, for example, to if I can relate this back to what Colleen was saying earlier, if you can imagine, for example, a, a, a child in a school, you know, listening to audio of the form, they read the book. Now, if you don't look or in, 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 in a blind person's case, feel that red becomes R-E-D, not R-E-A-D. So it's, it's, it's hugely important that for blind people who wish to, and many don't, by the way, but it's, it's, it's a personal choice. Some people do prefer to use audio exclusively, but it's very, very important that the channel of communication that is preferred by the user, whether that's Braille, whether that's audio, whether it's a Word document or a PDF, whether it's to obtain the information by email, um, is 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 actually recognised as a perfectly valid request. So provision of the, the the document insofar as is possible in the preferred alternative format um, is it should be most definitely encouraged. Yeah, th yeah. Thanks, Don. Actually, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea that that sighted people might know what's good for you um, in terms of a, a, an audio presentation rather than braille. Um, but I think it, it it really does reinforce that idea of uh, the importance of the multiple formats you've touched on. There's another thing that struck me actually. You, you mentioned the private sector, and obviously there's there's a few layers to this. Um, but one of them, and it's something we might sort of throw up into the wider panel as well, is. Um, we in the public service increasingly use the private sector to deliver our services. Um, there's a huge sort of contractor element in it, whether it's using, I mean, for example, your, um, what is it, the national car test is now outsourced to a, a Spanish company called Aplos. Um, there's, there's various other examples where the public sector is, is using private contractors. Um, I mean, these principles obviously need to apply, but it adds an extra dimension to the procurement challenge. I don't know if that's something from from the centre's point of view that you've you've come across as a challenge. We certainly have. Um, with your permission, I might actually defer to to, to James on this one. Sure. He probably has more knowledge of this than, than than I do, if I may. Certainly, James. Do you want to comment? That's a wonderful kick to touch there, Donald. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. I was just waiting for the unmute. Um, right, right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thank you, Brian, for uh, circling back around to that. Uh, and on on the matter of procurement, uh, th this is some uh, something that had come from the the feedback and some of the surveys and and some of the interest uh, from the, the sectors, from the, uh, the government bodies and uh, organizations. Who were mentioning that the previous versions of the toolkit were for the public service. And uh, they were really highlighting this point that there's so many relationships that occur that involve uh, public organizations. And I think as I had read out earlier is that uh, the, the, uh, the description there is, is that uh, providing services to the public or organ other organizations that are providing services to the public on behalf of the public uh, public service. So it, in the application where this uh, evolves and, uh, and, and your, your department actually helped us uh, 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 to clarify uh, the correct terminology and some of the approach uh, that's appropriate in the context of uh, applying design guidelines and relevant standards that are aligned with uh, regulation and requirements uh, as related to procurement obligations. And so in, in that context, uh, it's, uh, it's a, again, another resource. This toolkit is another resource and within the text of the toolkit, this is explained a bit in, in detail 
and it has some, as we would try to do in guidance like this, we would put in specific sentences that an organization can almost copy and paste and use that kind of text and language in their procurement purchasing activities. And uh, the intent here is that uh, we are trying to uh, bring on board more, uh, as was mentioned, more uh, private organizations and affiliate or organizations and uh, those parties who are producing and creating uh, materials for and on behalf of. And so that's, uh, that, like I say, can be found in more detail in there. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll be continuing to follow up. And uh, like I think I had mentioned, if, if people want to drill down and get into more detailed information on that, uh, they're welcome to contact our Center for Excellence. Uh, we can uh, hopefully make referrals to parties who are more informed on, on that and share more detailed information uh, as needed. So hopefully that answers your question. It does, it does indeed, and thank you very much, James. Yeah, and I think it's 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 just it's a really important point for for everybody present as well because um, I think we're all conscious to greater or lesser extent of the immediate service provision, but certainly that point where we where we operate through a third party, um, we tend to go out to tender on the basis of lowest cost, value for money, etc. Um, perhaps without those sort of considerations. I just, I want to sort of just bring in some, some of the rest of the, the panel more generally now and some of the wider questions. I mean, the one thing that strikes me is they're making this happen. Interestingly, I, I was just the other day, uh, I attended an event hosted by the Irish Taxation Institute about a 2000 page report produced by the Commission on Taxation and Welfare. And the first question put to the minister was, well, it's a nice report. Is it going to gather dust on a shelf? Um, and of course, the minister was very, said all the right things, um, but it is a challenging piece. I wonder, I, I might turn to yourself, Aideen, for a second on this, because as, as chief executive of an authority, and obviously we prefer this to be done by voluntary compliance, to use my kind of language rather than by enforcement. But ultimately, um, where does that balance lie? I mean, does the NDA have the teeth to make sure that we comply if, if compliance isn't voluntary or like, I suppose just just maybe it'd be interesting to just consider that that balance between, as I say, enthusiastic embracing and the necessary enforcement should it arise. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Brian. And and indeed, um, I suppose the NDA first and foremost is a is an advisory body to to government. And um, so a bit like Colleen, we're trying to gather a, a coalition of the willing. Uh, rather than uh, wa waving a big stick uh, around. And now we do have a number of statutory monitoring duties. Um, but I suppose what we, the way we approach the monitoring activity that we take part is, is a way of highlighting gaps or areas where further focus would be required. And then we go in and we engage uh, bilaterally with, with the bodies uh, in terms of guiding them on how to do it. And um, I suppose one of the, the key questions we're often asked is, uh, and it's something you refer to yourself, no, nobody is against the principle, but the real question is how, and that's where something like this particular guide is so important to be able to say, well, we have some practical guidance, and that's what we really do focus on uh, in the NDA, um, is making sure that the, the guides and the toolkits we present are practical, that they are easy to access and understand and use, and really just I suppose, taking some of the pain out of it for, for, for some organisations who might be struggling with the idea. Uh, so the monitoring then is a way then you can you can check back in and see how that's going over time. Has there been progress? Uh, and now are there new areas where, where there could be focus? So it's a bit of a bit of carrot and a bit of stick. I mean, obviously nobody likes to to come uh, uh, at the end of a monitoring um, ranking list, um, but. Uh, in terms of a sanctions or, or um, penalties, we're very much more in the area of persuasion uh, rather than enforcement. Thanks, Aidan. Yes, and, and again, it's interesting. There is a sanction, but um, exposure is a sanction in itself. Um, mm -hmm. As you say, if you come down the, the bottom of the class, um, that's that's challenging in itself. Colleen wants to come in on this. I think, uh, thanks, Brian, and I think it is to echo <clears throat> what Ian said in terms of, and it's a phrase I use, the coalition of the willing, and, and it was the approach um, that we would tend to take, and, and I think this is something I've used throughout my 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 career, 
is government policy is usually a really good place to start because if, if you do look at a range of I suppose government commitments um, you know currently we have the well-being framework you know there is even in, in education it, we're looking at lifelong and life-wide educational opportunities so you can always find a nugget um, of a policy imperative that that the work that we're doing aligns with and then it is about as it is using the toolkit and and coming with um, solutions and, and really practical actions that, um, you know, let, let's call them, you know, public service providers, be them in the public or the private sector, can implement. And the big carrot, and you mentioned it, is that favourite acronym that we've all gotten, which is the VFM, the value for money, because the reality is, if you actually, and as Aidy mentioned, do a bit of monitoring and case study, and we've seen it with the local authority, we've seen it with um, banks, that if you use these um, these tools, you will get better engagement. Um, you know, you will be more effective in in terms of delivering your services and people engaging with you. So, so that becomes the metric and the monitoring if, if you you were implementing it and we're we're following up. So, I think as as Aidy said, it is people realize they have to do this. They're not necessarily sure how. They don't necessarily have the time. And it, it's you know, through the work that we would do, the NDA, there's a range, you know, it's how do we make that feasible and practical and financially viable for people to do? Thanks, Colleen. And yes, financially viable sort of comes in at the back of all of that, because obviously we, we all run to budget, but um, yeah, that's I think that the point being made here is that, and it's probably less expensive to get it right first time as well, or to invest rather than playing catch up. There's a, a questions come in from the, the floor about advice for organizations wanting to kind of get on this journey. And I think the particular focus in the question was around bringing in a plain language approach and uh, the, the sort of idea that you might have, you know, multiple disciplines within an organization. Um, and just maybe, and for yourself, Colleen, might take this one as well. Um, that idea of where does one start? So, what we would encourage people to do in the first instance is actually have a look at our website. We have some, you know, I gave you some of the top tips, but we do have like that. There's checklists. There's checklists now in the toolkit. It is even doing that little bit of benchmarking yourself and saying, maybe there might be a publication that you have, or you know, even the, and, and Donal mentioned it. You know, the, the the information that goes on the website. You know, you know, looking at at text or information that's being delivered and see, you know, how does it stack up against. Um, you know, some of those checklists, if if you're seeing that, you know, there's a way to go, then it might be attending one of our free webinars um, and or looking at those materials. And, you know, depending on, you know, your role within the organization, um, you know, maybe there might be an opportunity um, to have some tailored training. Um, it's something, you know, we're consistently doing um, for a range of organizations, uh, either local authorities, you know, the Citizen Information Bureau, you know, Department of Social Protection. So there's there's things that you yourself can do. I've said this at the end of my presentation. Look at your own communications and say, can I apply maybe some of these kind of chats? Are you using um, abbreviations? without explaining them? Um, are you using a lot of jargon? So, you know, you get into that habit of kind of communicating in, in, in that way, but then it is down to perhaps an organization or a unit to say, listen, we want to do this in maybe a more structured way. So that's what I would kind of recommend. Small steps, um, and then before you know it, you're running. Excellent, yes, and, and obviously, but the message, there is help out there, you're not alone, reach out. Uh, Definitely and not. And there is actually just a plug for um, Claire's colleague, Sean. He has set up a plain um, language group on LinkedIn um, and is, is, is going to be offering a free um, kind of um, workshop um, on LinkedIn. So uh, join the plain language network on LinkedIn and you can avail us some free training. Excellent. Well, I think you might have a very large number of new members. In that You'll probably network. kill me now. I'll go from 200 <laughs> to 400 in, in, in one fell swoop. <laughs> Well, hopefully it can handle that. Uh, I'm just conscious of time, actually. We are coming to the end of the event. I want to pick up on, the, there's a few comments coming in on the chat line as well. Again, Gina Sparks, just to, to Donal in particular there to say thank you for the really excellent insights that we got from your presentation. Um, Eleanor Stokes as well, just to thank all of the speakers this morning for a really good session, particularly on the procurement. Uh, suggest also appropriate to engage before going to tender 
with the markets just for whatever goods or services we're procuring as well to make market providers aware of where of public sector thinking in terms of accessibility and universal design and that's obviously i think that's that's a really interesting insight just to to kind of inform the market and the tender process rather than sort of producing it as a surprise maybe at the last minute as well which can skew the market a little bit so so making potential vendors aware too uh, further comment there from Anne Green just to say that the slide shows and I think that was a particular reference um, going back to yourself James but I think it could equally apply to all of our speakers was excellent and will be provided with a copy I think Nora am I correct in saying that the entire event will be available to view yeah yeah so just to say there's been a few queries there about the websites and the links to the toolkit so um as james mentioned earlier um there we're currently just doing a couple of last accessibility updates to the toolkit um as soon as those are done uh, we'll share the links to where you can find the toolkit on the nda and on our own website with everyone and we'll also share a link uh to the recording of this event as well so hopefully that helps everyone Great, thanks, Nora. Yes, it would be deeply disappointing after I see the yeah, there are several people coming in on the chat line knowing when can we get it. So I suppose it would be disappointing if people weren't looking for it. Equally, it would be disappointing if people couldn't find it. So that's that's great. I think we've we've come to the end of the morning. We could there's obviously there's a lot to talk about in this topic, and we could keep going for much longer. But we are we are under the clock. Um, just maybe conclude again by echoing, and a lot of people have said it, but it is worth saying again, just congratulations to the NDA Centre for Excellence and for everybody who participated in the development of the updated toolkit. It's a really excellent and valuable piece of our armour, um, or our armoury. Um, I think the concern maybe I was articulating a minute ago that like many reports it might gather dust I'm not overly troubled by because I think even judging by the response on the chat judging by the attendance this morning I think there's huge enthusiasm for engaging with this it does throw up some challenges for us I think and that procurement one for example is a really interesting challenge but I think it's one kind of we'll we'll look forward to embracing um, before we conclude, again, I just, and, and it was touched on earlier, the people in the background who make these events happen, um, in particular, the wonderful Nora O'Donnell, who just appeared there briefly a minute ago. Well done, and thank you again for pulling all of this together, and Colin Flaherty with you as well in the department. Also, a special word of thanks to Owen Tunstead, who had moved on from the area, but... Um, he joined us again this morning just to help out and um, got us over some glitches and bumps in the technology. So well done to Owen. And then in particular to our really excellent group of speakers this morning, to Donald Fitzpatrick, Aideen Harnity, or sorry, Hartney, I do beg your pardon, Aideen, and James Hubbard and Colette Doobie. Thank you so much for, for bringing all of this to life for us this morning. And hopefully we'll see you again at some future event of the network. Thank you all very much. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Everybody. Thank Congratulations. You. All the best. Bye.